Hey folks, welcome back to Combo Class, where today we're going to learn about a clock-like type of exponentiation that will not only reveal a lot of cool patterns about number exponents, but also about prime numbers, numbers called pseudo-primes, and more. Have you noticed that powers of five always end in the digit? Five. A similar thing happens if we looked at powers of six. Why don't we take a peek at a chart of what all of the numbers do in our base 10 system when we raise them to different powers. Here's a chart where this axis represents the last uh, digit of a number, including single digit numbers like these numbers themselves or anything that ends with that when written in base 10. This axis shows what exponent we could raise that number to. And this chart could be continued forever, but it's unnecessary because it already repeats itself. We can see that not only do fives always end in a five, where any number that ends in a five raised to any power will still end in a five. And same with sixes. And in a little more trivial way, zeros and ones do the same thing. But we can also notice that although some numbers like four don't have a singular ending digit when raised to exponents, they do alternate between a cycle. Four to the first power is four, then 16 and then 64, 256, and the last digit goes back and forth between those. Similarly, numbers ending in the digit nine when raised to different powers will end in either the digit nine or one in an alternating fashion. But what about these ones that look a little more chaotic? They might look random until you expand how big of a pattern you're looking for, and then you'll see that they do have a cycle of their own, just one of length four. Numbers ending in the digit three when raised to different powers end in the digit three, the nine, seven, one, three, nine, seven, one, three, nine, etc. And every single one here has a cycle of at most Four. But what do all these patterns have to do with clocks? If our clocks had only 10 hours, and let's say we labeled the one on top, whoa, with a zero instead of a 10, what would these patterns look like? Well, doing exponentiation would be like going an amount of hours forward, an amount of times, an amount of times, an amount of times, etc. Because exponentiation is repeated multiplication and doing something an amount of times is like multiplication. So if I wanted to see what would it be like to go forward three to the fourth power hours, well, that would mean go forward three hours, three times, do that whole process three times, do that whole process three times. And altogether, I had four threes multiplied together. And if I did that starting from the zero on this clock, this chart tells me that I would end up on the hour one. These patterns are known as modular arithmetic, in this case, mod 10. We're used to base 10 counting of numbers, which makes us only really familiar with the patterns in mod 10. But we also know some mod 12 patterns from clocks. And if we look a little further into different sorts of clocks, we could see that a clock that just had the numbers zero and one, and we asked things like, I go forward three numbers, what do I end up on? would refer to the last digit a number has in binary or base two. This clock right here would help us out with base three. And these other clocks would refer to how different sorts of bases work. And if we jump ahead a few steps, something like a clock itself 
if we allowed 10 to be called some other symbol and 11 to get its own symbol as well, would describe the last digits in base 12. Modular arithmetic writes its findings in congruences, which use this triple bar equal sign. If I was on a 12 hour clock, cause we're talking mod 12, and I added seven hours, three different times, I would end up on the number nine or at least end up nine numbers later in the cycle from whatever number I had started on. We could also write that as modular multiplication, saying that seven times three is congruent to nine in mod 12. But what if I wanted to know something like seven to the one millionth power and what that's congruent to on mod 12? Would I have to go through a clock and do like a million different motions with some clock? Well, no, there are shortcuts. Now, before we jump into patterns like exponentiation and other bases, let me show you a cool mathematical justification for why zero, one, five, and six are the numbers that always repeat in base 10. When we ask about which numbers, when raised to higher powers, have the same last digit as their original self, we can check that just by comparing the number and its square's last digit, its second power. Because any time we perform a multi-digit multiplication, the last digits, the ones place, multiplying together, are the only ones that are going to affect the new ones place. If we can find that a number's square has the same last digit as itself, then we know that remultiplying that self by the square will still have the last digit, and that would be the third power. And remultiplying the self by that third power would still have the last digit, and that would be the fourth power, and so on. So what we're really trying to check is which numbers x squared is what we call congruent to x in mod 10. Now, if I subtracted x from each side of this, I would get that x squared minus x is congruent to zero in mod 10. And when you're congruent to zero in a mod, that means that you're a multiple of it. And so we're looking for numbers that their square minus themselves is a multiple of 10. Now we can factorize this. We can turn x squared minus x into x times x minus one. So we can see that what we're really looking for is numbers where them times one minus themselves is a multiple of 10. And we can note that since 10's factors are two and five, so one part of this factorization, either x or one less than x, must be a multiple of five. And that means that if we're trying to analyze what x is, we can say that x in our base must either end in the digit zero or five, making that the part that's divisible by five out of that, or that it must be one higher than this X minus one that would have to end in a zero or five. And so if X either ends in a zero or five, or it's one larger than something that ends in a zero or five, meaning that X must either end in a zero, one, five, or six in our base. But that's really just the tip of the iceberg of all the cool Oh my God. Now let's jump back to that chart from earlier to see what else we can find.
We can see a lot of cool symmetries on this chart, both in the columns and the rows. If we look at row three compared to row seven, you'll notice that row three repeats the digits 3971, and row seven repeats those same digits in backwards order. We can also look at some columns, like column four, to see that the digits in them, apart from the zero on top, read the same whether we read them from top to bottom or bottom to top. They are like palindromes. We'll also notice that on this chart there are times where the result of the last digit of the answer is always the same as the input we first put in. That happens in column one, when we're just going to the first power, of course, but it also happens in column five. All of the inputs to the fifth power end in the same last digit as themselves. And if we continued this chart further, we'd notice that since the maximum cycle that any of these move in is four, that it's going to repeat this every four exponents, and that after the fifth, the next time that we'll see all of the numbers in a row as the exact result being the same as the input will be on the ninth power. And that won't happen on the 10th power. It'll line up again on the 13th power. However, if we were to investigate a similar chart in a different base, say base five, and looked at which possible last digits a number could have in base five, different powers we could raise them to, and what the last digit of the result would be in base five, we'd not only notice a lot of the same symmetries that we saw in that earlier chart, but we'd also notice that one time when we get that string of numbers of results exactly lining up with inputs is on the fifth exponent, the same exponent that was the base we were talking about. And if we looked at a similar chart for base seven, we'd notice something similar. These are last digits a number could have in base seven. These are exponents we could raise them to. And one of the times when we get the exact answers that were the inputs is on the seventh exponent, the same number that we were discussing the base of. And it turns out that the fact that in base 10, it doesn't line up on the number 10 itself, but in base five and seven it does, relates to the fact that 10 is a composite number, meaning that it has multiple factors apart from one in itself that it could be divided into, whereas five and seven are prime numbers that cannot be evenly divided by any whole number apart from one or themselves. So our base 10 clock has many interesting patterns that emerge, that if we look a little deeper at why they emerge, we see that base 10 is just one of many different bases in a sea of possibilities. This mod 10, base 10 set of patterns is actually at a strange middle ground between different types of things that modular arithmetic is good at helping us with. For example, 10, the number that our base is based around, isn't a prime, but it's not super divisible either. If we were to count in an ideal base for humans, that might be something like base six or base 12, which are actually nicknamed anti-primes because they're highly composite numbers with more divisors than any smaller number. However, modular arithmetic is also quite good at finding patterns within numbers that are primes. And if we look at the modular arithmetic patterns that we can find within prime mods, we can find some even neater patterns, including tests to detect whether a number is or isn't prime. 
I have shown a primality test involving modular arithmetic known as Wilson's theorem in a previous episode. And although that can prove for sure whether a number is prime or not, it involves factorials, which get huge really quickly, making it super inefficient to actually test if any reasonably sized number is prime or not. But there are other tests involving modular arithmetic to see whether a number might be prime. You've probably heard of the historically classic Fermat's Last Theorem. But have you ever heard of Fermat's Little Theorem? Because in some ways, that's just as notable and a lot less talked about. This says that for any integer a and any prime number p, we're guaranteed that a to the power of p will be congruent to a in mod p. Or in other words, that a to the power of p will be exactly a more than a multiple of that prime. For example, if I took this base number a as two and took two to the fifth power, I would find it's congruent to that two and five is a prime. But if I looked at two to the power of 10 in mod 10, it's not congruent to two and 10 is not a prime. Now this may make you wonder if it works both ways as a super efficient primality test. Like for any integer a and any integer x, if this holds, are we guaranteed that that exponent was a prime? Or in other words, is this an if and only if statement? Well, if we took a base number of two and checked all the exponents up through 340, we might think that was the case, like many mathematicians throughout history thought. But it turns out that this actually is not true because if you go all the way up to two to the uh, 341st power, which is a number with more than 100 digits, it is congruent to two in mod 341, but this isn't a prime. It's 11 times 31, which makes this known as a pseudo prime or to be specific, the smallest Fermat pseudo prime to a base number of two. A pseudo prime is when you have a test that usually works to prove if a number is prime or not, but some numbers slip through the cracks and are exceptions. It has been proven that there are an infinite amount of exceptions for any base number, but some of these exceptions are even more notable than others. For example, there's a type of number known as Carmichael numbers, of which the smallest is 561. A Carmichael number is a number that no matter which base you're using, is going to satisfy the relationship that we were talking about, where some base number to some exponent is congruent to that base in the mod of the exponent no matter what base you use. Like we showed a number that for the base number two satisfied this, yet secretly wasn't actually prime, but Carmichael numbers will satisfy this for any base number and aren't prime. So in some ways, they are like the ultimate pseudo primes of this type. And if you're curious, these are the smallest Carmichael numbers. In general, pseudo primes like Carmichael numbers are exceptions to primality tests. Times where a test would normally tell you if a number is prime, yet some number passes that test and isn't prime. So why are these tests even useful? Well, 
primes are still so mysterious to mathematicians in many ways that it can be useful to even know if a number is what's known as a probable prime. A probable prime is when a number passes some sort of test that tells us it is most likely a prime, but we're not positive because there are sometimes some exceptions to these tests. Fermat's little theorem can tell us a lot of cool things about numbers, and Fermat was one of the greatest mathematicians of all time. But in my opinion, the greatest mathematician yet has been Leonard Euler, who not only proved Fermat's little theorem himself, but also had a generalization for it, which some people call Euler's theorem, but this guy invented so many different things that there are so, so, oh, many different things named uh, Euler's theorem. This particular Euler's theorem, although I did want to include in this episode originally, relates to this beautiful number theory concept called Euler's totient function that I already want to make another episode about. So for now, perhaps we've learned enough about our, our modular arithmetic and um uh, 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 and, uh, I hope you learned some cool uh, clock-like math today with me. Thank you all for joining me in combo class today with a special thanks to the people like my Patreon supporters who help make this show possible. I'll catch you all in the next one.